good afternoon, everyone. This is Catherine Wisner. And I just, uh, we're just right now, we're just waiting for the guest of honor, Kim Parker, to join us. And then there's a few more people also going to be joining up. So we're just going to give it a few more minutes. If you have any questions as we're going along, please um, put your question down at the chat and I will then interrupt Kim and we will ask Kim a question. And I think at some point we'll just have everybody um, go ahead and unmute their, uh, their mics and then we can just ask her ask Kim questions as we go along. And also just to let you know that I am recording this and so that it will be available for future viewing. And it'll be, I'll put it on the Laramie County Extension website and then I'll also pass it off to Becky Masson who will put it on the Laramie County Master Gardener website. So there'll be a couple of places where it'll be available for viewing in the future. And again, I am recording this so that it's available for, for everybody to see later. And Kim, I see that you've joined us. Sorry about that. I think I was mid. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think right. we'll give this just a, another minute um, for anyone else to join us, to join up. And I think you heard that I, I said I was going to record this for later, later viewing, later views. And... So how long do we have, Catherine? Do we have just 45 minutes or an hour or what do we what do we have? Well, we have we have um <laughs> I, I always schedule these for two hours. And it just just in case we go over or there's there's just more or more questions or whatever. So I, I, I plan a lot of, of extra time in these. So it's up to you if your program is 30 minutes and you're going to take 15 minutes of questions or it's 45 minutes. So it's a very flexible program. Okay. Well, I have about 50 slides. So my guess is, is that it's probably going to take about an hour. Okay. And then whatever time we want for questions. <laughs> okay. That works. That works. Okay, well, it's uh, 6.32, and I think we'll get going with the program tonight. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. And again, my name is Catherine Wisner, and this is the Laramie County Extension and the Laramie County Master Gardeners on Gardening for Success. And I talked to Kim about two weeks ago about walking around her neighborhood or going down to a couple other Master Gardeners' homes and taking pictures of what's currently blooming and, and to talk to us about what she sees that's growing, what we can all grow, what we can help other people with, and what's going on that's successful. So Kim has been a master gardener since 2000, 2005? Four. Four. 2004. 2004, yep. yep. So a long time, she's done everything from the plant sale to a whole host of things in between and trying to raise a daughter and work and <laughs> do the mommy thing. President. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Kim has worn a lot of hats with the Laramie County Master Gardeners. And with that, I, Kim, I'm going to turn it over to you and it's your program. Okay. So let me just see, um, can you see my slides at the moment? Nope. Nope, okay, hold on. I gotta figure out what's going so, on. So if you go down to the screen share at the bottom, 
Ah, there we go. Yep, click screen share. All right, sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get back to uh, just my regular. So I, I just wanted to, to mention that um, I, I really enjoy giving presentations and I think Catherine figured that out. So she's, she's asked me to help with uh, giving presentations occasionally to her interns. And I've also assisted the Platte County Master Gardener program by giving them a, a program almost every year that they've had one. So I just, um, this was fun to do a little bit different one and I kind of tried to put some of the same information in, but yet make it more fun and more current. And I do have to admit that my gardening, uh, my gardens look better in the spring and early summer. So I have fewer photographs of the um, late summer and fall plants, but that is something that I will rectify. I will be getting some better pictures as we go along. So if we do this again, I will have better pictures for that part. So, okay, let me see if I can start sharing my slides here. Okay. Can you all see that now? Yep, that works. Okay. Alrighty. I think I think we're in. Okay. Um so this, like I said, was kind of a, a fun change up from the presentation that I usually do, and um hopefully will be still educational for you master gardeners, but yet something that people who haven't gardened very much can also benefit from it. Um, what I wanted to accomplish today was basically cover some of the gardening challenges that we have here in Cheyenne, as well as to inter, sorry about that, hold on. Go away. Um, is to <laughs> introduce you to some of the really beautiful, low maintenance, high performing perennial plants that we can have here in Cheyenne and give you some ideas to create, create beautiful pollinator friendly landscapes from spring to fall in your own yards. Um, and then lastly, just to give you some gardening tips and tricks. So to help you, if you, especially for those of you who haven't gardened very much yet. So the first thing we need to cover is the USDA hardiness zones. Um, you'll notice that the bands of color roughly follow latitude here across the United States. And that's just having to do a lot with day length. But you'll notice that where it starts to become mountainous that those zones really get chopped up. And that's because there's also an elevation element to hardiness zones as well. So this is a close up of Wyoming's hardiness zones and you can get this off the USDA website. It's kind of neat, you can zoom in and see what your particular, like if you live up in Happy Jack, you might be able to get up there and say, oh gosh, I'm a zone four. Okay, uh, you're zone four up there in Happy Jack, by the way. <laughs> so um, right now, um, just recently they changed, uh, Cheyenne's zone from 5A to 5B, they look at the last 30 years when they make an adjustment like that. And right now we're looking at the period 1976 to 2005. And we are zone 5B, which means our average winter is about minus 10 to minus 15 is as cold as we get. Now, do we have winters where it's colder than that? Absolutely. Uh, but pretty, pretty rarely, our average usually is above that. But I also wanted to point out that even though we're zone 5B, that microclimate or where you plant a plant is very important. 
Is it on the side of the house that gets the wind? Is it on the sheltered side of the house? Does it get the sun in the afternoon? So all of that really makes a difference. Wind exposure, the type of soil that it's growing in, soil texture, soil pH, and soil moisture level are important. How much humidity the plant has in that small microclimate, what the precipitation is, maybe because of where it is, it doesn't get as much snow or as much cold as, as it would otherwise if it were just planted out unprotected. Um, winter snow cover is very important to a lot of plants and also the amount of sunshine we have. One of our, you might think it might not be, but one of our biggest challenges for plants here in Cheyenne is the fact that winter, we don't have snow cover to insulate the ground and the daytime temperatures are above freezing and the nighttime temperatures are below freezing. So what you have is this constant freeze thaw cycle all winter long from, you know, at least the top several inches of soil. And that can be very hard on a lot of plants and um, especially trees, it can really confuse trees. So especially if we have one of those, you know, early March, late February warm spells where it's 60 degrees for a week, that can really get plants thinking, maybe it's spring, maybe I'm supposed to start to come out of dormancy. And then almost invariably we'll have sub-zero temperatures after that and, and experience winter kill. So where the plant is growing is probably as important or even more important than knowing that we're in five, zone 5B. Five Okay, some of our other challenges. Uh, these are some climate stats that I was able to find from 2014. Uh, the NOAA website has climatic data, but they've been reorganizing and I have not been able to find it since their report for 2014. So I apologize for the datedness of this, these statistics, but I, I think it gets the point across pretty well. Um, our, we do have, usually wind. Um, our average wind speed, at least in 2014, was 12.2 miles per hour. Our highest wind gust was, our highest wind speed was 51 miles per hour gusting to 66. Our prevailing wind direction is out of the northwest. We, in 2014, we got a whopping 18.2 inches of precipitation. Our average is only about 16. So this was above average year in 2014. And boy, two inches of precipitation can make a big difference as to which type of plants grow and how well they grow. We are a very sunny state. 62% of our days are straight out sunny days. Uh, we only have about 24 days a year on average that are cloudy, which, which means there's not any sun. So like when it's storming or snowing or something like that. Our average relative humidity is pretty low or about 56 percent on average. And the other challenge that we have here in Cheyenne is the fact that we have a large number of severe thunderstorms. Um, we average 50 days a year, 50 days a year where there's severe thunderstorm activity. Now here in Laramie County, we have three times as many damaging hailstorms as anywhere else in the state. So that makes us number one in Wyoming. And we also have, not surprisingly, more tornadoes than any other county. So that's just kind of some gardening challenges. So we've had hail um, already this year a couple times. Um, I experienced just a couple days ago in my garden some damage due to the hail that we had was the night before last, I think. Okay, we also have a fairly short growing season. Our average frost-free dates, now this is again weather data that's available from NOAA. Um, they usually express this as a probability. For example, on, you know, there is a 90% chance that we will have at least 116 days that are frost-free in Cheyenne we have a 50% chance that we'll have 137. And 
you know, if you want to plant that brandy wine tomato, you know just exactly that there's a 10% chance we have 158 days without frost. <laughs> so there, those longer season uh, plants that we might plant, this gives you a level of comfort with, is that in an average year going to work for me? Um, you know, I have gardened, I can remember years where, where we were, didn't, hadn't had a freeze and it was almost November. So, but then I also know that there's years where we freeze like Labor Day. So it's just really have hard to know, but this is statistically where we sit. Average freeze dates, these are usually indicated by the last spring and first fall freeze dates. Basically when there's a 10% chance that we will get less than 32 degrees Fahrenheit and in the fall where we have a 90% chance. So in Cheyenne, that date is May 26th and on the, in the fall, we've got a 90% chance that we'll have had a frost by October 8th. So that kind of gives you a window there. And I, just for kicks and giggles, put Jackson in there. You'll notice that they're pretty much guaranteed at least 12 days without frost. <laughs> and, and at the maximum, they'll have 60 days. So just to put things in perspective, it's not as bad as it could be in Cheyenne. All right, I wanted to go through a few definitions for you. Now, those of you that are already gardening or have been gardening for a while, you are probably pretty familiar with these definitions, but for the sake of those people out there that might not have gardened very often, uh, perennial plant definitions that are important. Um, what we're talking about here in this presentation is our perennial plants. So we're looking for plants that live for more than two years. And that's basically just to differentiate between annual plants that live one year and biennial plants that live usually for just two years. So the word perennial originates from a combination of per and annual, which means through the years. So that's where the word formed. Um, what we're looking for for a perennial plant is that maturation takes at least one year often multiple years or possibly even decades. If you think about a spruce tree, it might be 20, 30 years old before it ever starts to make spruce cones. Um, a perennial plant will flower and set seed more than once. Part of the definition of a biennial is that as soon as it flowers and sets seeds, it dies. So a perennial plant will flower repeatedly and set seed repeatedly. Uh, it may reproduce vegetatively using stolons or rhizomes. Other type of clones, you know, you might see, uh, for example, banana trees don't actually even reproduce sexually at all. They're all vegetatively reproduced. Those little black specks in bananas are seeds, but they're infertile. They're never sterilized or they're never fertilized. So, Another thing you can look for to determine a perennial plant is the fact that it's evergreen. Anytime you have an evergreen plant, that is going to be a perennial plant. It could also have a period of dormancy, for example, trees or blue, bluegrass lawn or something like that is going to go dormant during the winter. When you have a tree that is evergreen or a plant that's evergreen or has a period of dormancy, you have to remember that that's a period when it cannot create its own carbohydrates. In other words, it can't photosynthesize very well during that period or at all. So consequently, they also have to have some way to store carbohydrates for that cell metabolism during the winter. Um, even though it's dormant and it's re much reduced rate, they still do metabolize. They still respire. So you need to have some way to store carbohydrates. These would be roots, rhizomes, corms, bulbs, tubers, that sort of thing. So that's an indication of, of a plant that's a perennial. Okay, there's a couple different types of perennials that we usually talk about. Hardy perennials, they live through most winters. 
And this is going to be your native species, or in our case here in Cheyenne, Zone 5B, I'm going to say that hardy perennials are going to be any perennials that are rated for Zone 4 or below. Uh, tender perennials usually will not survive the winters, or they'll only survive the mild winters. Um, in our case here, we're, we're looking at, you know, zones five. Most years we can get away with five, but like I said, every once in a while there's a year where it's colder during the winter. So tender perennials, definitely things like gladiolus and dahlias, those will not overwinter here. They are perennial in warmer climate zones. Then we also need to talk about short-lived perennials. These are perennials that they live and flower usually profusely for several years, two, three, four years, but then they die. And it's almost like they kind of wear themselves out. Some of the ones that we think about in this situation would be penstemon and foxgloves, uh, sometimes delphinium, that sort of thing, that they, they live for a short period of time, but then they, sadly pass on. We hope that maybe they reseed themselves like penstemons do. Okay, some other important definitions. We have to talk about a native plant. I've mentioned that term quite a bit already. And that is basically a plant that's evolved in or has indigenous to an area. In North America, we generally consider a native plant as one that was here prior to European colonization. That's generally because of all of the agricultural plants that were brought with the settlers as they came across the United States um, and, and those introduced plants that they brought with them or seeded. So that's generally kind of the, the break point for, for native plant. A naturalized plant is a non-native plant that has spread into its new environment and, and whose population has become self-sustaining. A good example would be, for example, the dandelion. There's no way we're getting rid of that guy. Their dandelions are here forever. <laughs> They're very, very happy here. So a weed is another term that gardeners often use. And a weed is just an unwanted plant in a human controlled setting, such as a field, a garden, a lawn. And it doesn't have a botanical meaning. It's just a contextual meaning weed is something that I don't want as the gardener. I don't want to be there. Then the last term we need to talk about is invasive. So this is a naturalized plant. In other words, it's not native to the area, but it's been so successful in, in adapting to its new environs that it outcompetes native plants and then it can spread unchecked. Now the state of Wyoming has an invasive weed list and you can tell all of those plants are just very aggressive and very successful where they grow. So, okay, here's an example. This is a little, um, I think it's called a hairy aster, but it's, if, if I had a corral or a feedlot or something like that, there was, this weed was growing in it, it they would be considered a weed. In my rock garden, however, I just love it. It makes these cute little sunflower things all season long. So it's not a weed if I want it to be there. On the other hand, I like to show this photo. I'm sure the governor didn't realize that he was growing one of those noxious weeds in his cinder bed <laughs> just right outside the state capitol. He didn't want that to be there, so that's a weed. Not only is it a weed, it's a very invasive one. That's a Dalmatian told fox. So I wanted to mention really quickly, where do you go to find good plants, to find new varieties, to find plants that you know are gonna be successful? Um, if you can't ask Catherine and you can't ask a master gardener, can't get to our plant sale. Some things that I would recommend you check out are the Perennial Plant Association. Every year they have a plant of the year. Um, all American selection, they do, uh, that's probably the oldest plant testing organization. They were established in 1932. There's only over 200 test gardens across the United States, and they test everything from new vegetable varieties, new flower varieties, new perennials, new trees, new shrubs. They, they test 
a phenomenal amount of new um, varieties. And then there's also Plant Select. They are more local, more specialized to the Rocky Mountain area. And they also have a series of test gardens all over the Inner Mountain West, Rocky Mountain region. And they look for plants all over the world that grow in a similar climate and that can then be propagated by greenhouses and nurseries that are going to be to offer for sale because they know they're going to be successful here in, in our part of the world. So those are also really good plants. Okay. So just a few words on how to design perennial flower beds. I have to admit, I am not a very good designer. I, um, I design by trial and error. I put it out, but I'm going to pick back up with uh, designing perennial flower beds. And um, I have to kind of say a disclaimer. I am not a good designer. I design more by trial and error than I do um, planning stuff out to start with. So, but these are some general tips that should help you. Let me get you back to my screen. Okay. Catherine, can you see my slides? Yep, sure can. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Pretty pretty flower pictures. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Okay. So there we go. All right. So some of the things that you want to consider when you're designing a perennial flower bed is It may not live very long, but it's likely to reseed itself, so it is continually going to have more penstemons in your bed. Um, the other thing you can think about is, um, does it grow strongly but not overwhelm its neighbors? You don't want to bully in your, in your flower bed. You don't want to plant a mint in your perennial flower bed because shortly it will be nothing but mint. Crowd everything else out. The other thing you want to look at is will it have a long bloom time that's complementary to the other plants in the bed? And is it attractive when it's out of bloom? Remember all but about one to three weeks a year are going to be the plant when it's not in bloom. So you want to look for multiple season interest if you can. For example, uh, the spring leaf color is one color and then the flowers come. Possibly fruit is a different color or maybe the fall leaf color is interesting. Or potentially you could have a seed head or branches that look bark that looks really cool during the winter time. Um, then the last thing you really wanna look at is, is your flower bed, is the plant that you're considering for your garden, is it generally pest and disease resistant or are you going to have to apply pesticides or fertilizers regularly to keep it healthy? One of the things that I do as a gardener is I pretty much look for the plants that look fantastic without any help from me because I don't have time to baby plants. So that's just my perspective. But you know, sometimes there might be a plant that you just absolutely love because your grandma had it and you're gonna have it no matter what. So that's, a, that's something that you can kind of decide on. Okay. This is an example of a, a flower bed that, you know, the, the grasses lay there in the winter time have frost or snow on them, just looks kind of cool. This was actually, somehow I managed to set a sprinkler and it froze overnight and I had forgotten to turn the sprinkler off. So when I woke up in the morning, all of the grass blades had these frozen little icicles on them. It was just really kind of neat. Okay. So some of the other things we're gonna talk about before we launch into our pretty flowers are um, some tips and tricks for perennial gardeners. 
Um, let's be honest, we also face, we pretty commonly have poor soils in our garden, usually either very clayey or very sandy soils. So if you're preparing a perennial garden bed, pretty much when you put it in is about the only chance you're going to get to amend the soils. So if you're going to, um, that's the time to do it. Uh, you'll want to amend with a good quality organic matter or mulch to usually about a one third volume. And then you're going to want to till that or spade that in down to at least 12 inches. Or if you're dealing with deep rooted perennials, you'll want to double dig that. Maybe take a tarp, dig the first layer out, then dig down deeper to get that double dig. Um, and then obviously, if, you're, if you need to fertilize, use a slow release fertilizer. That should carry it through the first growing season at least. And then um, pretty much the rest is going to be top dressing you know, top applications of fertilizer because this, you're not probably going to be disturbing the soil after your bed is in place. One thing you really want to focus on if you're dealing with perennial plants is that pay attention to the spacing. This is very important that plants are not crowded together for them to grow well. Um, you have to have good air circulation between them. So follow the guidelines listed on the plant labels or even look it up online if you're not sure. If, it does, if the label doesn't say, look it up online. It's very important that you know how big it's going to get and you, you plan accordingly. Don't be tempted to crowd them in. Um, I accidentally, I didn't realize I had crowded them but because the roses were in a corner in my backyard where the fence was protecting them from good air movement. I managed to um, create a nice situation for a black spot fungus. So now that's something that I'm going to have to deal with forever in my yard because once those roses have it, it's very difficult to get rid of. So please, please, please don't overcrowd your plants because you can end up with a pest or a disease problem that you didn't anticipate. Okay. So then just general rules of thumb, select plants that do well with the same light and water re regime. When you, when you develop a bed, pretty much you don't want something that has to have a really wet soil in amongst things that want a drier soil or a better drained soil. And then also consider the different bloom times that, to ensure that you get the colors that you want. And this is something that I take to heart. Uh, don't be afraid to edit your garden. Um, if a plant is not doing well where you planted it, or if one pink is fighting with another, and by the way, you can edit that either by taking, transplanting one of those two plants that's, the colors are just not right with each other. You can either transplant one or move it away, or you can put a silver or blue, green, gray plant or a white flower in between. And that breaks it up just enough that you can, maybe they can coexist. So, or, you know, maybe you need just, I just want a shot of blue right there. That garden needs a bit of blue right there. Put one in, you know, or a plant has expanded beyond where you wanted to keep it. Um, you know, dig that up and put it in a pot and take it to the Master Gardener plant sale the next spring. Um, or perhaps you have a gardening friend that just says, oh, I love that flower. Can I have some of it? So don't be afraid to edit your perennial gardens. You can transplant, you can divide, you can add more in. Don't be afraid to edit. Okay, and then kind of the last tips and tricks, I wanted to talk about mulching a little bit. There's lots of things that you can mulch with. I've even seen people use black plastic and carpet and <laughs> plywood and anything else. I mean, you can mulch with anything that prevents water from evaporating from the soil and prevents light from reaching the soil surface. Um, however, organic mulches like wood chips, compost, grass clippings, even newspapers will break down and add organic matter to your soil, which is never a bad thing in Cheyenne. 
you'll need to use at least a three to four inch deep layer in order to prevent weeds from sprouting. Inorganic mulches like pea gravel can help with plants that need to keep their crowns dry. Rock garden plants, for example, often um, do better with a gravel mulch. However, do not mulch around the plant stems or cover the plant crowns. You don't want to smother the plant. You don't want to cause a fungus problem. So now we get to the fun stuff. This, these are the pictures of, of my favorite plants. Um, a lot of these pictures came from my yard and my gardens. However, I've had several master gardeners contribute photos for this presentation today. So thank you, thank you to Barb Gorgeous and Michelle Bohannon, Kathy Shreve, and Catherine Wisner. So thank you very much for sending in photos that I needed to help round this presentation out. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about bulbs because I think bulbs are something that are very, very much underused. And I never learned about using bulbs when I start, first started gardening, but now I just can't wait for the first, first bulbs in the spring to bloom. I love to see the bees working those bulbs, those flowers. I mean, it just, it's, it's an awesome feeling to see the world start to come alive. So some of the ones that are, are good to grow here in Cheyenne are the reticulated iris, crocus, daffodils, grape hyacinth, of course, um, and then tulips. So not all tulips are hardy here, but if you get a species tulip, Gregii, Kaufmannii, Kaufmanniana, <laughs> Darwin, or emperor tulips, those are reliably hardy here. The others, you can kind of just treat them as annuals if you'd like. Okay, so a bit about planting bulbs, like I said. Normally, you're gonna plant bulbs once it starts to cool off in the fall. You don't wanna plant them too early because otherwise they think it's spring and they'll sprout rather than waiting until next spring. So usually October to November, um, many times I've planted bulbs right around Thanksgiving when I have a day off. So just as long as you get them in before the soil freezes. You're going to want to use a low nitrogen bulb fertilizer when planting and again during bloom and when the leaves are green. That's when they can use it. That's when they can take it up. Um, you can use a bone meal um, or blood meal, fish meal, any of those type of things. Um, however, if you have dogs, or there's dogs running around the neighborhood, I would strongly advise <laughs> that you be careful with those products. I don't use them personally because I don't care for the smell of them. I can smell them even when they're planted eight inches down. <laughs> so um, you're gonna wanna plant your, trench, your, your bulbs in trenches or holes. Um, be careful of creating a line of flowers because some flowers do really well, but what happens when some of them don't come back? Then suddenly you have a gap in your line. So a lot of times things like daffodils are much, they look much better if you plant them in bunches. So you plant in a hole rather than a trench. Um, obviously you're gonna water when the, the flowers or the leaves are present. They're actually pretty drought heart, you know, drought tolerant when they are not recharging their bulbs. So as soon as those leaves die back, it doesn't matter how dry it gets. They're fine. They're good to go until next, next spring. So, okay. The reticulated iris is one that I mentioned. It is pretty much the first thing that blooms in my yard. I can see them starting to poke up their first little First couple of days of April, they will start to bloom. Sitting right now, that's a glory of the snow. They will also come out about the same time. These are cute little things. They're only about four inches tall. And they are hardy to zone five, it says, but I have had luck growing them here in Cheyenne, even in the colder winters. And I've also grown them in Lander, which is usually considered to be more of a zone four. So they're a hardy zone five. 
plant. About the same time, the crocus will come out. And the snow crocus, the smaller ones bloom in early April. April, And the giant crocus, or the Dutch crocus, bloom about two weeks later. You might notice that some of these crocus are planted in my lawn. This looks really neat. The only thing is, is you have to wait until those leaves recharge the bulbs and wither down before you mow your lawn the first time. So that means I don't mow my lawn until about this time every year. Um, sometimes that means I have to get off the swather because the grass is so tall, but uh, it does give me a good excuse not to mow my grass. If you're looking for one of those, I can highly recommend these. So the, if what I would recommend is that you, you interplant your snow crocus in your yard and not the giant crocus because they just take a little bit longer to recharge. And usually if we get a nice wet spring, your grass is about a foot tall by the time you can mow it. All right, these are hardy to zone four. Easily hardy here. So the daffodils and the narcissi are also hardy here. And the bloom times from those, they can start in April and they can go through till about the end of May. And just depending on the variety, usually the doubled ones are some of the later ones and also some of the bigger ones. Most of these are zone three, but there are a few daffodils or narcissus, some of the jonquils that are not reliably hardy here. So do pay attention to the zone when you're purchasing bulbs. Okay, tulips. Now these are a couple different kinds here. We've got some emperor tulips there. We've got some Darwin hybrids, some species tulips, and um, you know, just a tulip that my neighbor had that has just bloomed and bloomed and bloomed for decades. So I don't know what it is, but it's pretty. Okay, species tulips we have here. We have Tulipa humilis, the eastern star. That's the um, magenta one with the yellow center. Tulipa clusiana, Cynthia. That is the yellow one going counterclockwise. Then we have bright gem up in the top right corner and the peppermint stick. So those are all what are considered species tulips. And they all do very well here. Okay, let's talk about um, some spring shade to part sun plants. Most of the shade perennials bloom in, in spring to early summer, so I thought I would put them in, in here. Some of these plants obviously are for the, the leaves and they are good throughout the season, but we're gonna cover this, the shade plants here in the, the first part of the presentation where we're talking about spring plants. Um, shade perennials can generally take morning and evening and or evening sun as long as they're shaded during the hottest part of the day. And uh, the ones I'm gonna to cover today usually prefer the soil to be moist. And then something to think about when you're designing a shade garden is that if you're wanting to bring a, a light in your garden or create a dynamic grouping of plants, look for plants that have lime green leaves, have cream colored leaves, silver or variegated leaves, and that just really brightens your garden. And there's some examples there of some, some pretty common, pretty bulletproof shade plants. Bleeding Heart, Jacob's Ladder, Columbine, Cranesville, Hostas and Ferns. Now obviously Hostas and Ferns, you don't really plant those for the flowers, although Hostas do flower, but they do add a, a nice interest to the texture of the leaves. Um, because we get so much hail here in Cheyenne, I would recommend that you look for the smaller leafed varieties of Hosta. The, the big giant ones, if we get a damaging hailstorm, they're kind of raggedy for the rest of the year. Okay, here's some different varieties of bleeding heart. On the left, you have Valentine. 
in the center there, that's an example of that golden leaf that really is brightening a shade garden. That's called gold heart. And then on the far right, you see the standard old fashioned bleeding heart. There's some columbines. Now the thing I love about columbines is there is just a huge variety in shapes and colors, whether they're single or doubled. Um, and that's not what I like about them. What I like about them is that they, they cross pollinate and reseed readily. So you really never know what color of columbine a seedling is going to be. And it's just kind of a discovery. Um, the, the burgundy and yellow one there came up from seed and I just love it. It's, it's a striking columbine. Uh, let me see, clockwise we have the black barlow double, Colorado blue columbine, our mystery columbine, and then the William Guinness. There's some varieties that I have in my yard. Okay, Jake's, Jacob's Ladder is another very nice shade garden perennial. Um, the Brie d'Anjou there is, is a variegated leaf, it has a slightly paler flower than the standard. And some people say that Jacob's Ladder has a skunky smell, so you might not want to plant it underneath your bedroom window unless it doesn't bother you. Crane's bill, now crane's bills can be either shade plants or they can take full sun. Just look to see what that particular variety can handle. Um, some of them are mounding kind of plants or almost a sub shrub they can get so large, where there are others that are more low growing and almost more like a ground cover. Um, on the far right, there is a, a mounding crane's bill that's out in full sun. And it does recede a little bit, um, but perennially, basically it's a standard perennial. And the one in the middle there is more of the ground cover gradually spreading kind. And hardy geraniums or cranes bills are usually blue or pink flowers. Okay, so. If you have shade gardens and want to have flowers for the rest of the year, there's some options, but um, there's some fall blooming shade perennials. There's some toad lilies that bloom later in the year, but there's, it's difficult to find shade perennials that don't bloom in the spring. So I didn't include any of those because I didn't have pictures of them. <laughs> All right, let's talk about spring sudden spring sun perennials. The full sun is defined as at least six hours of sun, and it can be morning sun or afternoon sun, but it has to be at least six hours long. Most sun perennials can take some shade, but they may not flower as much or at all, or they may be not as vigorous as they would otherwise be. So you can really tell if a plant is getting too much shade if, for example, your peonies are not flowering and it's underneath a cottonwood tree, it's got too much shade, even though it can get morning and afternoon sun, it's not getting enough sun. Plants that want to be wet like their wetland plants. I'm gonna mostly focus on, uh, sorry, I'm evidently still having some internet issues. So if I lose you again, Catherine, just text me and I'll, I'll know. Um, I'm gonna focus on the ones that are low water requirements to moderate water requirements, because that's typically what works best in Cheyenne. I wanna point out here in the middle of this, the center of this slide right here is a Missouri primrose. And that's one of the ones I'm gonna to talk to you about first. The Missouri primrose, I think every garden should have one. It's just me, but uh, it has its main bloom time in June, but it will continue to make blossoms until the 
until fall, until frost. So it's a very nice plant. It's a beautiful yellow that mixes well with almost anything. And uh, the flowers are huge. They're about four to five inches across. And they only are open for one day. They usually will open in the evening and stay open till about 10 o'clock the next, next morning. Once it gets hot, they'll fade. They'll fold back up. And I have to say that the seed pods are very cool on these. If you want dried flower arrangements, they look like flowers themselves. So definitely is a must have if you're into dried flower arrangements. Some cultivars have been developed that have narrower, more silvery leaves. Um, the one pictured here is lemon drop there on the bottom of the slide. That is lemon drop and it is it's the same species, it's just a different cultivar. And the Missouri primrose is a native species and it does not require additional water once established. Now that's something we really need to focus on is doesn't matter what you're transplanting, when you're establishing a plant, it may need water, it may need water every day until it is established. So just keep that in mind that when you're talking low water, you're talking an established plant. Okay, here's some low growers for you. There are oak leaf stone crop on the, the, the yellow flower on the right, and that is a trough dianthus behind it. And then on the left, we have dragon's blood stone crop and pink creeping phlox. So those are some nice cherry perennial plants for you for the spring. All right. This has got to be right up there with Missouri primrose. I think everybody needs Rocky Mountain penstemon. In fact, I like it so well that my entire backyard has turned into a penstemon farm. <laughs> um, the reason I like it is because the butterflies like it so well. Not only is it a beautiful color, but the bees and the butterflies and the native pollinators, this, I can just sit in my yard and watch the pollinators and enjoy a cup of coffee and just really have a good day. So the species name for that is Penstem Instrictus. And this is a native plant, like I said, it doesn't need any additional water. Although I find that if you do water it during while it's blooming or right before it blooms, that it will typically have a longer bloom period. So I usually do irrigate mine um, while they're blooming. It likes to recede on bare soil. So as my rock garden grew in, and there was no more bare soil exposed for the seed to fall on and germinate. Uh, the penstemons moved to my backyard where there is bare soil. They are semi-evergreen. -ever the leaves actually turn a burgundy color. The stalks, the flower stalks will dry down, um, but the basal leaves will stay um, evergreen. And obviously that's a swallowtail butterfly right there. One of the other really reliable early spring plants is catmint. Now this is different than catnip. Catnip is pretty aggressive and um, is one of those that you better plant it in a bucket or something like that and make sure it doesn't make seed because it will spread and take over. Catmints are much better behaved. They're very nice in borders, like say if you have a walkway, or in the corner, like mine is in the corner of a brick stair. Um, very nice, it stays very polite. It does make some seed. I have a couple seedlings that have gotten around, but they're pretty easy to just dig up and, and remove. This plant will bloom all summer long. Um, bees just love it. And like I said, this one is partic this particular one is growing in a crack in a, a concrete block stairway, so you can tell that it doesn't need any additional water. Um, it's happy just to do its thing right there. Okay, I know that this is not a presentation about shrubs, vines, trees, that sort of thing, but in my backyard, my Harrison's yellow rose is starting to bloom, and it's just such a beautiful rose that I had to include it. It's also called the Yellow Rose of Texas, or even often called the Oregon Trail Rose. 
settlers brought this rose with them as they came west. And the interesting thing is, is that you can tell where early homesteads were because there's a Harrison's rose still there. So that's how hardy this rose is. Um, you might be able to see, the, the resolution might be enough to where you can see the serious thorns that this plant has. So nothing much eats it. Um, they think it's a hybrid between Rosa fetida and, uh, I'm not sure I can pronounce that, Pim Pinellifolia. <laughs> Um, but anyway, they think it's a hybrid of those two species. And do give some thought to how you want to contain it before you plant it. Like I said, with those sharp thorns, it's very difficult to work with. Um, and it wants to form a thicket. So if you've got a place for a thicket and you want one, just plant it without any regard. However, if you want it to behave with other plants, figure out some way to contain it. What my husband and I did is we bought a stock tank and cut the bottom out of it. Put the stock tank in the ground and put the rose in the stock tank. We still have to trim off any, any rhizomes that go over the edge of the stock tank. <laughs> Every couple of years we have to trim it a little bit. So it's absolutely gorgeous for about two weeks every June. So that's a beautiful plant. Um, Poppies are another delightful spring plant that wants full sun. They need moderate water. Um, oriental poppies do well here, but we also can grow Icelandic poppies. And the colors range from white to pink to orange to red. So that's generally poppies. The next plant that I really enjoy in the spring is iris. And iris are, you can find such a variety of iris that it would be very easy to become a collector. If you had, you know, 100 acres to fill, you could fill it with all the different varieties of iris. Um, the tall bearded or German iris are the most common and they're very hardy here. There are some that rebloom but uh, they just really create a stunning display in June. Oops, apologize. Obviously a delphinium is another standard spring flower. They're just starting now. Um, sadly, the windstorm that we just had really wrecked mine. I hadn't gotten them staked up yet. So very important if you have the taller varieties, make sure that they are secured in case the wind blows so they, they, they don't fall over. Um, the spot of color in the center of a delphinium is usually called the B. So in case you wonder what that means on the tag, that is the, the spot of color in the middle. Usually it's white or black. Delphinium colors are usually blue to purple, some pink, some white. Um, and they come in small, medium, and tall varieties. So pretty much you can figure out, well, I want it to be the front of the bed, or I want it to be in the back of the bed. I want a taller variety. So you can plant it almost anywhere in your, your flower garden. So this is starting to edge into summer. So late spring, early summer. Um, my Stella d'Oro daylily just started to put on some blossoms, but it really hasn't started its full bloom yet. Those, these are a little bit later, usually after the iris are done. Um, daylilies are another thing that, boy, you could easily become a collector of daylilies. I have seen just a phenomenal variety of daylilies. They come, normally their colors are orange, pink to red. They're starting to become some blue. I've seen some lime green. So there's just really, the, the breeders on these are just doing a fantastic job and getting new and more striking color combinations. Uh, I wanted to include in a picture of the old fashioned daylily down there on the lower left. That's 
I think probably one of the original types of daylilies that were that was growing in my parents' yard. And I transplanted some of, some of them here just for nostalgic reasons. There are some that rebloom in the fall, and that gives you a longer period of interest. So you can look for that. All right. Let's talk about summer sun, low water plants. One of my very favorite plants is the blanket flower. This is a native that they've made several cultivars for. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Different colors usually. Um, this plant doesn't need much water, but do keep an eye on it. If it starts to look wilty, water it. Um, but I can, I can, you know, I usually water my flower beds with these in it. Maybe once every couple weeks, once a month, maybe just depending on how much rain we're getting. Um, and I have to tell you that the butterflies just love this plant. I know you can't see it very well, but the picture on the right was taken actually late September, early October, and it has three butterflies on it, that one plant. So they were just mobbing that plant. So this is a, a plant that will produce flowers starting right about now, clear through till frost. Nice plant to have. So here's another one that especially if you want to assist the monarch butterfly, this is a really good one to plant. Milkweeds are natives here and they can grow in almost any soil, almost any side of your house, but they are a large plant and they do spread. So just keep that in mind. Um, they also kind of like the blanket flower, occasionally need water, but you know, they, they muster, muddle through even without water. I wanted to show you some of the, I've, I've uh, had swallowtail butterflies and caterpillars on my milkweed. I've had monarch butterfly caterpillars on my milkweed. Obviously the bees love them. Interesting thing about this particular genus of plants, they are designed to be pollinated by butterflies. Only the butterfly's leg can pull the pollen sacs out. So it's kind of an interesting coevolution between the milkweeds and the butterflies. Um, that little monarch butterfly caterpillar, I just doted on that thing. The sad thing is, is it was about four feet away from a robin's nest. And one day I came out and I couldn't find it and I couldn't find a chrysalis. So I'm afraid that the robin ate it, even though it says, please don't eat me. The center photo down there, um, there's not just the, the big showy milkweed pictured here, but there's all sorts of different native milkweeds. This is the orange milkweed, and that's also a nice one to put in your garden. Okay. Another summer sun, full sun, low water plant is tick seed or Coreopsis. And there are a bunch of native species of the Coreopsis that the greenhouse industry has developed into cultivars, which are also very hardy and perennial. Um, I want to thank Catherine. She went out this afternoon, even <laughs> this evening, <laughs> and got a picture of the native Coreopsis growing in her pasture for me to include in this presentation. So thank you, Catherine. Um, that one is probably, I'm guessing, about eight, 10 inches tall and blooms now and um, does not require any additional water because it's a, it's a native. Now, one of the cultivars that you see in the greenhouse industry, you see on the right-hand side, that plant blooms a little later and it is probably about as tall as I am. It'll be blooming here in probably about a, about a month, so in July. Um, but it, um, there's a huge variation in what the leaves look like, what the flowers look like, but mostly the flowers are gonna be yellow. There's some that have some red in them that can resemble the blanket flower. But these also will kind of continue blooming through the fall. Um, here we go, daisies. 
almost everybody loves daisies. They're one of the most popular perennial plants and they are available in tall and short and single and double and white and yellow. They're just all sorts of daisies now. I do have to say that the more, pardon me, the more old time varieties will spread steadily and can reseed. So this is where if you have the old time varieties, you just need to develop new neighbors, new friends that you share your daisies with when your daisies outgrow the spot you have to keep them in. I do need to mention though that the newer, the patented varieties that they're developing now, make sure that if you're building a pollinator garden, you might not want the more like the doubled flowers or some of the yellow ones. I'm not sure that their uh, pollen production is the same as the more old fashioned straight daisy varieties. So keep that in mind if you're after a pollinator garden. So another one of the most popular plants in the summer, full sun, moderate water, is coneflowers. So these are, Rudbeckia is the species name, and there's, I think there's about 25 native species that they have hybridized and um, developed cultivars from in the greenhouse industry so that they can be um, more hardy or bigger flower or, or what have you. But most of these are hardy here. There might be some that are not, but there again, be aware of some of the more like the doubled flowers or the, the cultivars that are a little more messed around with because they may not be as winter hardy and they may not produce the same type of pollen and nectar for your pollinators. Okay, differentiate a little bit. They also call this a cone flower, um, but it's a different genus. So this is a, an echinacea or a purple cone flower. And there are also a bunch of purple cone flower species that are native and they have also hybridized them and made cultivars for the greenhouse industry. So here again, the closer they are to the native varieties, the more hardy they're likely to be, as well as the more beneficial for your native pollinators. All right. Everybody, it seems, loves bee balm. So bee balm is one of those summer plants that is very good to grow here in Cheyenne. And it is absolutely a magnet for bees and hummingbirds. If you can imagine that bright red color, uh, hummingbirds will fight over this plant. Um, they're usually pink to red, sometimes purple, but uh, very, very nice plant. You might want to do a little research. The only problem it tends to have is it can, can have powdery mildew problems. So if you're shopping and see two different red ones that you like equally well, see if one of the two has more resistance to powdery mildew. And also, they do tend to seed around. So if you don't want that, make sure you deadhead. And that might also encourage the plant to make more blossoms. Okay, so now we're moving into the fall plants. And keep in mind that a lot of the, the, the spring and even summer plants that we covered before are still going to be blooming into the fall. So I didn't add a lot of new fall plants, but uh, Blazing Star or Gay Feather or Leatris is a native that will bloom late into the year. And I mean, sometimes even after frost. So it's, it's a very, late bloomer and it's absolutely critical for that late season bee and butterfly food source. There are several different species and some of them want wetter soils than other, but in general when I think of the liatris that grows out on the prairie, it uh, doesn't need any additional water. Just check the tags. Okay, Fall sun plants with moderate water, uh, the New England asters, and sadly I don't have a fantastic picture of these, so I apologize. Um, I've got a picture of purple dome asters and the um, 
Alma Pachki. The Alma Pachki is hot pink with yellow center. The purple dome is a, a nice deep purple color with a yellow center. And these are very, very important again for butterflies. We've had, I'm not sure what species it is, but you can see a picture of it of, of there on that purple dome. Just literally cover these plants when they come through. So very important for late season color as well as um, pollinator food. And that's kind of the end of my slideshow. I just want to encourage you, even though we do have problems with wind, we have problems with soil, we have problems with hail and tornadoes and, you know, those winter warming and freezing cycles. There are so many plants that I could have put into this presentation. It would have taken us four hours to get through it. So <laughs> I hope that encourages you to try and try new things and experiment with things. If you see something you like, try it. The worst that happens is it might not make it, but I'm gonna grow a rosemary plant in my garden someday, which is zone six. So, you know, we can all have our goals. But anyway, be happy and enjoy your garden this, this year. Do you have any questions? Well, Kim, thank you. That was very informative and beautiful pictures. So I, I thank you for all the work you put into that. It was, a, it was excellent. And again, if there's any questions out there, any, anyone with any questions, thoughts, comments, um, you can either type that into the chat or you can unmute yourself and just join in. But uh, yeah, that was a, a great program. And of course, there's uh, an amazing looking Christmas cactus behind you and... <laughs> Yeah, and some orchids. <laughs> yep. yep. Do you guys have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. I'm one. I wonder uh, about transplanting rhubarb. I have a very large plant, and it's in my flower bed, and I would like to move it, but I don't want to lose it. Well, the good news is, is you probably won't be able to kill the thing. Um, so <laughs> it's going to be harder for you to make sure that it's really gone from your flower bed than it is to kill it. Okay. Um, rhubarb are very, very tough. I think they're zone two, aren't they, Catherine, or something? Yeah, they're, they're pretty darn durable. They're, They'll grow in Alaska, so they're yeah. very hard to kill. I, yeah. Um, yeah, it might be easier on it if you transplant it early in the spring while the leaves are still small, um, or possibly even in the fall after it starts to go dormant. Yeah, uh, I was thinking of the fall. Yeah, so I mean, but honestly, if you can just get a nice sharp shovel, um, dig around it, and then just slice down through it, and if you can see where the leaves come out of it. Just try to make sure that you'll, you'll notice that there's clusters of leaves and then just try to not cut through that cluster of leaves. And so basically what you'll end up with are some leaves with a chunk of root on it. And um, stick it in a pot and bring it to the plant sale next year. <laughs> <laughs> so Kim got a question here from Christine on foxglove. Uh-huh. And the question is foxglove camelot, full sun or shade, and any tips? And the next comment on it, it seems to be mixed directions on the web. Uh, well, I'm not familiar with that particular variety. But uh, keep in mind that foxgloves are going to be one of those group of plants that's considered short-lived. In fact, there's a lot of them that are just strictly biennial. Um, I don't know whether Camelot is one of the biennial type or one of the more perennial type. Um, most foxgloves want at least some shade. I, I've, at least that's been my experience with it. I don't know. 
there's been some that are uh, there's been some plant select ones that are set up to run in full sun uh, i'm trying to remember the variety name but i don't know um it seems like most of them want a little bit of shade does that help christine okay any other questions comments thoughts <laughs> christine's back yes that helps Okay. And then uh, her other comment is, I made a rhubarb sweet and sour chicken a couple nights ago. So, <laughs> so yeah. rhubarb, <laughs> and it is a, a vegetable. So, you know, we treat it like a dessert. So, I'll go figure. <laughs> Don't eat the leaves. Any other questions? I have to say that I am, um, my background is in native plants. Um, I learned to botanize when I was working for the Forest Service and my job was to chase the cows around and tell how much of the plants they'd eaten. And in order to know that, I had to know what it was to start with and what it was supposed to look like. So that's how I learned to botanize. And uh, I am still learning about perennial plants and probably always will be there's as many new varieties as they're coming out with and new things that they're developing that can grow that didn't used to grow in our zone i'm probably going to be doing this for the rest of my life <laughs> which is a good thing <laughs> so another question crocuses do your crocuses get up more than two to three inches well, the snow crocus ones, the ones that come up first in, in early April, uh, those are shorter generally. Um, two to three, sometimes four. The Dutch crocus or the giant crocus that come up a couple weeks later, those are typically a little bigger. Um, but crocuses will often, like for example, if you've got it growing in your yard, in, in your lawn, they might get slightly taller than they would if they were growing above bare soil. I don't know how they figure that out, but I, I think it's part of, you know, maybe a temperature differential or something there. So it might vary depending on where you have them planted is what I'm saying. Okay, great, Kim, thank you. Hey, I wanna remind everybody of the Master Gardener monthly meeting that will take place on Thursday, June 18th, and it'll be Zoom, via Zoom, and we'll have a short meeting, and then um, Barb Gorgeous has put together again another virtual tour of people's gardens, and then I've also done a pro, I will be doing a program on what I'm seeing when I'm doing my yard calls. So I've been seeing some interesting stuff so far this year. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll, we'll call it a night and I'll see you a week from to, a week and a day from now. Oh, and Christine also is reminding me um, for everyone to check the Laramie County Master Gardener website, lcmg.org. Lots of plants still looking for homes. So if you need vegetables or whatever else is on there, please go to the website and go shopping. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not seeing any hands raised. I'm not seeing any more in the chat. Um, Kim, any, any passing comments or tips? You know, I would just want to reiterate, you know, if you want to try something, just try it. I mean, you really can't hurt to try something. And who knows, it might work and we'll all have a new gardening sensation afterwards, after learning about it. So I am not a garden designer, but everybody, you'd be surprised how many people will come up to me and say, oh, your gardens are just lovely. It's like, gosh, well, you know, it took me five years to get it that way because I didn't like the way it looked first and then I edited it and changed it up and don't be afraid to try. Perennial plants are pretty tough 
and they, you know, you can dig them up and move them if you don't like something where it is or give it to a friend or get another one from a friend and plant it in. Or if you want to add bulbs to your garden, you know, just do that. So, I mean, it's very forgiving and it's a lot of fun. It's a good hobby to um, continually stretch your, your skills as a gardener. Great, Kim, thank you very much. So with that, I'm not seeing any hands raised. I'm not seeing any messages or, oops. Um, yep, there's always some plant out there to try. There's always something out there that, and you never know, it might, you might have the perfect little microclimate for some beautiful little plant that the rest of us can't grow. So don't be afraid to try. With that, I'm going to say goodnight to everybody and thanks for joining us and we'll see you later. Good night. <laughs>